And I want to welcome everyone to this workshop, Introduction to Google Earth. I'm Janet Reyes, the Geospatial Information Librarian here at UC Riverside Library. And it's going to spend the next hour, maybe a little bit less, uh, filling you in on some of the products that are in the Google Earth suite. We're going to focus on three of them that are most useful probably to people in academics, but there are several other um, products in the Google Earth line that we'll also take a brief look at. And uh, some of the very interesting and even fun features of some of these products. So thank you for joining us today. Um, this workshop is being recorded. And in a couple weeks to a couple days, the recording should be available on the library's YouTube channel in the geospatial playlist. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Also, if you have registered for today's workshop, um, I have your email address and I am going to send you a copy of the slides. So you will have available the slides themselves and the, the links that are included. So you'll be able to retrace uh, what you saw today in this uh, workshop. It's not really intended to be so much of a hands-on kind of thing. So it's pretty much just uh, sit back and uh, watch and ask questions. But um, I think it would work best if you experiment with using some of these products on your own time. But I'm also very happy to answer any questions that come up um, either during the workshop or afterwards. So um, I have an assistant today. Her name is Ashley. She'll be helping me with posting things into the chat and also monitoring the chat in case I keep talking and talking and don't notice that there's something um, I should attend to in the chat. So with that, I guess we'll get started and make sure we have enough time to cover everything. And we will start with the UCR land acknowledgement. We at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting places home to many Indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. So here's the overview of our workshop today. These first few points are the ones that we're going to spend the most time on because, again, I think these are most applicable to people in an academic setting. But we will take a look at other Google Earth products as well. Uh, a little bit of Google My Maps, just because it does tie in with some of these Google Earth products. Uh, a slide about some caveats or things you should watch out for as you're using uh, these products. And then finally, a slide with resources, links to different resources for you to learn more. So let's start with Google Earth on web. This is probably the newest of the products. It was introduced in 2017. And it's something that's accessible from your browser. So you can view Google Earth imagery and Street View without needing to install anything on your computer. You can do um, measuring and draw points or lines or shapes. And it comes pre with some prepackaged tours or presentations that are of general interest. And we'll try to take a look at those in a little bit here. And similar to those types of presentations, you have the ability to create some of your own uh, digital storytelling pro projects. So we'll take a quick look at how you would go about doing that as well. And what I'm going to do is run through the slides I have on Google Earth for web, and then I'll pull a session of it over um, on my screen so you can see what it looks like. And we'll talk in a little more depth about some of the things I've pointed out on the slides. So to access it, you just need a browser. And uh, no surprise, it works on Chrome since it is a Google product, but it also works on Firefox, Edge, or Opera. I have sometimes found that it actually works better for me on Firefox than it does on Chrome. So um, there you go. Um, and it does take a lot of graphic capabilities, a lot of memory. So you want to have your machine performing as well as possible. So I have seen this um, advice to enable hardware acceleration to maybe improve the performance, if you're, especially if you're encountering uh, difficulties with the way it's performing. 
which honestly, in preparing for this workshop this morning, I had some difficulties. <laughs> so fingers crossed it'll work for us now. Um, but anyway, all you have to do is go to that um, URL, earth.google.com, and that should pull up the web-based version of Google Earth. So let's take a look at some of the features that are available to you, starting with what you will find along the bottom. At bottom left, you'll see these icons, which will enable you to create your own place marks or points. And this uh, icon will allow you to draw either lines or shapes. Sometimes you may want to keep an eye on this uh, percentage value because it is so heavy with imagery and it takes a lot to draw it up. If you're doing a lot of panning around and zooming in and out, sometimes it takes a while for it to catch up to what you want it to do. So if ever the imagery looks really fuzzy and you think, what's going on here? You might want to check if that doesn't say 100%, it's probably still trying to work to catch up with what you want to do. So just be aware of that. At bottom right, along the bottom, you're going to see several measurements and figures. In this screenshot, I have converted them to uh, feet. They come in as a default. They come in as meters and kilometers, but you can toggle it to feet and miles in uh, settings. Um, so whichever your preference is, is what you can see at the bottom. This uh, figure represents uh, the altitude of wherever your cursor is uh, above sea level. And this represents the camera altitude above uh, the ground level. And of course, we have latitude and longitude and um, distance on the ground here. So a couple other features here. If you double click on this compass point and then you grab it with your cursor at the top, this enables you to swing the view around. So in other words, you no longer have to have north at the top. If you would prefer a different aspect of the view, uh, you can create that. You can click this button for a, an oblique or a three-dimensional view and click it again to toggle back to a perfectly vertical view. Um, click this little person to get the street view for wherever your cursor is, assuming that you're on a street. And then this uh, icon would allow you to center the image directly on your current location. So honestly, I don't understand the logic behind how Google has set this up, but what they've done is there is a toolbar on the left-hand side that includes several things. And then if you expand it, you see several of the same things, but not all of the things, but then some additional things. So it's it's a little goofy, but we'll, we'll take it a little bit at a time here. Um, the magnifying glass obviously lets you search for a place. So any place that you can enter in, it'll take you there on Google Earth. This ship's wheel is what they call Voyager, and that's where you'll find all the prepackaged uh, views and tours and learning objects. And hopefully we'll be able to take a look at that in just a little bit to give you an idea of what's there. This thing that looks like a die face, that like a dice that you would shake in a game, is I feel lucky. And that will just, you click that and it just takes you to some random place on Earth and um, you can see what it is. And then you click and you go to another totally random place on Earth. Um, the next icon is projects, and the next slide will cover that in more detail. Um, this icon is for map style, and what that includes is things like you can control how much information is on the map in addition to the satellite imagery, um, whether you want lots of information or a medium amount or none at all. Uh, you can also have the ability to see the three the building's in 3D in a little better clarity than uh, what the default is. And if you're zoomed out at maybe continental or subcontinental level, it has an animation of clouds in the last 24 hours. So if you would like to see that, you know, you can see that. It doesn't work if you're zoomed in very far, though. Here's our tool for measuring uh, distance and area. And so let's see, now that we've expanded this, we have talked about this and this and this, photos allows you to see a uh, ground photo insets. So that's different from Street View. These are photos that people have taken in a particular place and uploaded to Google. So um, if that would help you at all, you can toggle those on. Here's the settings where we find you can do the things like changing it from feet and miles to um, kilometers and meters and back and forth. 
and so forth. And the next thing we're going to talk about after this section on Google Earth for Web is uh, Google Earth Pro, which is also known as Google Earth on Desktop. And here you see that they give you the option that you can download it from inside uh, Google Earth for Web. So projects. Again, the logic doesn't entirely make sense to me, but if you want to make your own app, um, presentations, learning objects, little tours, anything like that, you can do it from this projects interface. It contains, or the project that you create can contain any of these things. So it's really quite robust. And if you're familiar with ArcGIS products like ArcGIS Story Maps, uh, it's along the same lines, but it's based obviously in Google Earth instead. To make a project, you would want to log into your Google account first. And um, there's a tutorial link here to create a mapper story that sh kind of shows you what to do. It's based on the life of uh, Jane Goodall. So that's pretty interesting to, to go through and create the story um, given the, the prompts that they give you. And I have an instructional example of somebody here at UCR who made a, a learning object uh, from this, this tool. And hopefully, again, I'll be able to show that to you. Um, at the end of this set of slides. Now, the reason I said this doesn't make sense to me is because from the projects interface is where you also make maps instead of projects. Um, so we need to talk a few minutes about what those files are and how they work. If you are making a set of points or lines or polygons in a Google Earth product, it's going to go into a file that's known as a KML if it's a fairly small file, or a KMZ if it's a file with many features in it or images or extra things like that. So if you're interested in why it's called a KML or KMZ, there was once upon a time a company called Keyhole and they developed the technology that Google Earth is based on. Uh, Google saw it and liked it and bought them out. So um, now it's Google Earth, but they did at least keep the the nomenclature that the original company um, used for their files. So that's why it's called a KML. Again, if you're familiar with other types of GM, GIS, geographic information systems like ArcGIS or QGIS, um, you know that when you create points, lines, or polygons, they're sh saved in a file that's known as a shape file, not a KML. However, it is possible to convert between the two. So it is possible sometimes for you to be able to view something that was created in a G different GIS in a Google Earth. Um, so if you have been given a KML file and you want to import it into Google Earth Web, what you do is go to the project button and choose open. And then among the choices that you have, in addition to opening a project, which is what you would think when you click project open, you also can import a KML file from a Google Drive or from some file that's stored on your computer. Uh, viewing this in Google Earth for Web may not work if it's a pretty complex file. So uh, this is a fairly lightweight, um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, product. So it doesn't handle super complicated or uh, dense material. So just be aware of that. And my next slide just includes a little bit more about this working with projects or KMLs, because I, again, to me, it's not super straightforward. But here are all the options when you go into the project interface. So it allows you to either create a project or open one that already exists, but they're going to have to be in Google Drive. Or again, you can create your own KML file of a map or import one from Google Drive or one from your computer. Um, remember at the very beginning, I showed you the icons that were in the lower left side where you could just start adding points or lines or polygons. If you do that uh, without opening a project or getting into this project interface first, it gets a little more confusing. Like if you wanted to save it, you have to go through a few additional steps to get there. So my recommendation is, if you're going to create something that's like a map and you know you want to save it, it's best to go into the project um, interface first rather than just starting out directly with those tools. 
And finally, at the bottom here, I just wanted to show you um, when you create a project, uh, when you see it in in your Google Drive, um, it'll look something like this as far as what type of file it is. So it really is a, a computer application. All right, let me see if this will behave itself and I will bring over an example of Google Earth. And I guess you're all seeing that now. Um, yes, so here are those icons where you can draw things. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if I double click this, it changes places and then I can, you know, kind of move it around like that. Um, I did want to show you the things in Voyager. So I'll just give you a quick uh, look at some of the categories they have. So they have some uh, things based with nature. Um, Street view is just kind of, again, just random stuff. Um, they have categories of culture or travel or education. Um, let me just show you one of these in education so you get a feel of what a project can be like. Um, I like this one. So let's, for instance, look at, at this. So it zooms to the first place. It tells you a little bit about this. You can have a video, for instance, here that um, you know correlates to what they're trying to inform you about. And then you can just click on, go to the next place. And they tell you something different and so forth. So that's kind of how these projects can go, but you can have all kinds of content. You can have links to other things, um, all of that good stuff. So I also wanted to show you the time lapse um, real quick, if I can get back up there. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, when you click time lapse, it's a little bit like the I feel lucky because it'll just take you to some random place on the globe. And what it'll do is just, you can see this timeline advancing. Um, right now, we're not at 100 now we are just now at 100%. So um, you're going to see the imagery just change. However, the earth has been changing in that place over time, and then it'll start the sequence again. You you, you can also just type in a location. Um, like I've done Las Vegas, and that's really remarkable to see how much that's grown over the last 30 years. Um, so you're not just stuck with the ones that they take you to. You can do this time lapse uh, for any location on Earth. So I said I wanted to show you um, the project that was made by one of our faculty members. And this is it. This is the ge geology of Yosemite Valley. Um, you can click on any one of these points, and it will give you a pop up that can include imagery or a video or a set of images. Um, a lot of these will have um, links to other types of information. Um, this was created at the start of the pandemic when it was suddenly clear that the usual trip to Yosemite Valley for the geology students was not going to happen. So um, Nick Barth created this instead. So in, in addition to just randomly clicking on things, you can start the presentation and it'll take you through in a preordained sequence. Um, So I'll just give you a sense of this. Um, we start in the tunnel and then go to the next location. Which he's now switched it over to a view, um, an image of, of what this looks like. So anyway, you get the idea of what you can do with this. It's really, it can be quite an amazing um, educational tool. So let's go on now to Google Earth Pro, and I think I'll pause after this and uh, see if there's any questions about either of these first two tools. Um, Google Earth Pro is something that you use, you install on your desktop. 
it's got a little more uh, power behind it. it. It allows you to import and export GIS data. And some of the things that you can import include scanned maps and GPS data. It provides historical imagery, but unlike what we just saw with Google Earth Web, you can choose any of the available years or months and years and have that as your base map. So it, you don't have to just see it in like a tenth of a second. You can really dwell on whatever year that is available to you and, and take a look at that. Uh, Google Earth Pro also uh, provides many data layers as well. We'll take a little bit of a look at what those are. So you can create maps here. Um, you can also create projects and narrated tours. So it could be a tour, again, that just functions pretty much like what we just saw, but you can also add your own voiceover if you want. And also, if you have data in a spreadsheet that includes latitude and longitude, it is possible to load that up into Google Earth Pro, and it will create a layer of points that correspond to those um, rows in your data table. But it's a bit tricky, so we'll talk a little bit about why it's a bit tricky. Um, the way you access it, well, we saw one way, which was from within Google Earth for Web. But another way is you can go to this website, and uh, they have all the Google Earth products kind of, or many of the Google Earth products listed there, and you can scroll down to Google Earth Pro and install it from there. So this is what the interface looks like. Again, um, when I get through these slides, I think I will bring over a, a live view of Google Earth Pro, so we can take a closer look at some of the things um, I'm going to talk about in these slides. So it looks a little bit more like a traditional GIS for those of you who are familiar with that. We have a menu at the top and some, some tools in the toolbar. Anything that you create in Google Earth Pro is going to show up in this uh, listing of places. And then down here are the layers that they provide um, as a default, and you can switch them on and off as you wish. You see, we've got our, our north arrow and our ability to pan and zoom is now over here instead of down at the bottom. So let me talk you through some of the features that you find on this um, toolbar. This one will just toggle off that side panel that we just looked at where the list of layers were. This is how you add points or place marks, uh, shapes or paths or lines. This is what you would click if you have an image that you'd like to overlay and bring in. Uh, if you wanted to record a tour from what you're doing, uh, this is the button that you would use. We'll talk about these three in a second down here below. Um, here's your measuring tool. And then this one will capture the view that you currently have on your screen. This one allows you to view whatever you're looking at in Google Maps. And this one takes you over to Google Earth on web. But these three, are, I think, are super interesting um, tools in particular. This one with the backwards arrow on the clock, that's the one that enables you to see what historical imagery is available. And uh, I hope I, I'll be able to demonstrate that. This one is kind of a neat trick. It just uh, allows you to change what time of day it is in your view, so you can change the sunlight and the sun angle. Uh, for instance, that's kind of fun to, to do if you're looking at something like the Grand Canyon. Um, and then this one is pretty remarkable. So the default is Google Earth, but if you click on the drop down for this, this planet symbol, you can see the sky, which includes the stars and the galaxies and things like that. You can see Mars or the moon, just depending on what you choose. So that's um, super interesting for a lot of people, I'm sure. So up in that uh, menu at the top under tools, I wanted to show you some more of the things that are available when you click that. The tables will show you information about the tours and the place marks that you, you have loaded in. It's kind of like an attribute table, again, for those um, of you who are familiar with other types of GIS. Um, if you are using GPS data, you would click this, and this will enable you to import the, that data or even enable real-time tracking, which is pretty interesting. Um, remember I said you can create a tour which will capture the movements uh, between different features on your map, and that's great. And somebody else who has Google Earth Pro can view your tour, but if you want to make it 
even more accessible, what you can do is use Movie Maker, and that will create an MP4 that can be exported, and then anybody pretty much with a computer can view what you've created um, as a movie. The region eight just means that when you have lots and lots of features, as you zoom further out, you won't have that overprinting of a, just a blob of features all scrunched together. It'll kind of filter out some of the ones. And then as you zoom in, more and more features will appear. So that enables that um, type of activity. There is a flight simulator and uh, I've included instructions for how to use it. Um, I myself have tried it once and it was not a happy flight. <laughs> I will just say that, not, not the fault of the application. It was just um, pilot error. But I hope um, if you feel so inclined that you will give that a try, you can take off from any airport, fly around and hopefully land. So the next slide is going to cover what's here when we click on options underneath tools. And I wanted to show you, especially this tab about touring. Um, so you're not stuck with the default time lapses between features or how much time you linger on each feature. You can show, you know, kind of change the variables of different things. If you're creating a tour that's following along a line, you can change how camera is tilted along that line, all that kind of thing, how fast it's going and so forth. So you have some abilities to, to tweak the way your tour comes out. Um, so this is kind of a slide that collects uh, several different ideas. And I did want to mention that I do have a, a really good example of scholarly use of Google Earth Pro. Another professor in Earth Sciences, Rich Minnick, recently completed mapping, I think it's over 60 tree species in California, one layer at a time, creating a KMZ for each layer of tree. Um, and this is going to be a great resource for lots of people. And he did it all using Google Earth Pro. And he really liked the feature of where you could spin it around so you don't always have to see like the south aspect of of hills and mountains and things you can look at the north side as well that really helps a lot with um, identifying trees as well as you can maybe pick the season that you want to look at and maybe some trees are really identifiable in the spring most of all so you can just try to focus on you know using that imagery so he found it to be a very useful tool and um, I, I look forward to when this is available to to lots of people so um, but if you are going to use Google Earth Pro, the way you go about creating either tours or um, maps or KMLs is to organize your content into folders. So you create a point, you create a line, whatever, you create several of them, you save them all into a folder and then save that folder in as a KMZ. Um, so, or you can read record a tour. Like I said, it'll capture movement from one feature to the next, and you have the option for audio narration. Now, I tried it once just honestly capturing my screen movements, um, and I thought I was being very smooth, but I, I was not, and the result is absolutely horrible to see. So I agree with this tip that they gave, which is what you would want to do is just organize your features in a folder in the order that you want the tour to progress, and then you can record from the folder. And I think that creates a much more uh, smoother um, outcome for you and anybody viewing that. So again, I've created, um, or I've included tutorial links for how to create a map or project in Google Earth Pro, uh, how to create a tour. And this third one um, is a tutorial about how to do that thing I mentioned where if you have a spreadsheet that has data points with latitude and longitude, you can load it in and it'll create the points for you on a map. Um, that tutorial has never ever worked for me. <laughs> so I created this next slide. What the tutorial involves is something called Spreadsheet Mapper. And I think in step five out of 25 or something, it I always, it just doesn't work for me on step five, so I can't get any further. And if you have that experience too, there are other ways that you can get your tabular data uploaded into Google Earth Pro and have it create a point layer. Sometimes you can honestly just do it if you have a CSV and you import it by going to file and then import. 
this is um, honestly, it can be fussy. So you may get lucky and it works perfectly, but it also many people have experienced that it, it does not work well for them, especially, I guess, if it's a very sort of a large um, CSV with many, many rows. Um, so another approach would be to take your CSV data and convert it to a KMZ file prior to bringing it into Google Earth Pro. One way to do that is to run it through Google My Maps. And this story map, which was created by a faculty member at Lehigh University, um, shows you how to do that. And she has uh, many other tips for uh, using Google Earth, so I'm going to share that on my resources slide as well. She also pointed out that there are some converter apps out there where it can create a KML from a CSV. So um, anyway, if you look, go to that tutorial and it doesn't work from you, um, you do have other options. And this last slide about Google Earth Pro um, shows the available data. Um, when I gave this workshop two years ago in the summer, I had two slides and it had lots more data. And honestly, I am glad that they removed a lot of the data that they used to offer because it was things like restaurants. And then they even had, you know, subcategories of restaurants like Italian restaurants and Chinese restaurants. I was looking at that data in areas that I am familiar with and saw immediately that it was not up to date or super accurate. So um, I was really glad that they took it away because I don't think that was a very reliable layer to include. It may be right some of the time, but it was definitely not right all of the time. So hopefully these features that they have still included are um, reliable enough for your purposes, but I would not look at this as a definitive data set for, oh, now I know where all the picnic areas are in the Forest Service property. Um, I, I would not trust it that far. So let me pull Google Earth Pro onto my screen and you can take a look at what that looks like. Okay, there we go. Um, you can see this up here in places is where I've been playing around with it over time, doing some of the uh, tutorials and just creating places and whatnot, organizing my, my places into folders. Uh, you can toggle them on and off your view. This uh, map of Glacier National Park was one that was part of a tutorial where they teach you how to uh, bring out like a, a scan of a map in and kind of register it to, to the area uh, that it covers. Um, so I, what I really want to show you here is this is the historical imagery. And you get this slider up here. And um, you think, wow, they've got imagery from May of 2023, like that's really current. Well, it, it is probably not going to be that current. Um, that's a little bit deceptive. So as we slide around, we can go back in time a little bit, but um, if we bring it forward again, really the most, in this case, the most recent uh, imagery they have is from December of 2020, which is not too far away, but it is kind of almost three years now. So um, just be aware that it's not going to be consistent as far as how far back it goes. You saw when I was zoomed out, I think the lower date was 1930 and now it's saying 1984. So um, yeah, that is not consistent either as far as the maximum age of time and it's all of the ones in between are not going to be necessarily consistent from place to place as well. Um, if I take this all the way back to 1984, yeah. Oh, it didn't jump, huh. Um, that's pretty good imagery. Sometimes the, the older stuff is really hard to see and you appreciate how much better the quality of imagery has gotten over time. So, that's pretty much what I wanted to show you for those first two tools. I'll take a quick pause and see if anybody has any questions before we move on to Google Earth Engine. OK, 
Okay, well, let's go on to Google Earth Engine. This is a really powerful tool, especially for people who are investigating things like climate change and earth science um, impacts. It functions at a global scale, so it can handle petabytes of data. And it's great because researchers don't have to spend a lot of time in agony wondering how they're going to store all these uh, image files, which are very, very dense, um, take up a, a lot of memory and so forth. They can just do it all in Google Earth Engine. Um, the compute power in Google Earth Engine is backed by Google data centers, so that helps too. They can just focus on what they want to do and not worry about all the um, storage and um, data file management type concerns. The focus here is on uh, manipulating raster or grid cell data, such as imagery or remotely sensed data. So to get this, it's a little bit different. You have to fill out a form and they will read over your form. And if you pass, like you have a good enough use case for using Google Earth Engine, you'll receive an email with instructions on how to get started. It's only one per customer. So you can only have one Earth Engine account associated with one Google account. So if you have multiple Google accounts, you cannot create mul multiple Google Earth Engine accounts. So the features, um, a code editor for algorithm development. It has a couple of APIs. Any analysis that's done in Earth Engine can be downloaded for use in other tools, which is pretty nice. You can also import data sets that can be shared or you can keep them private. You can also upload shape files, which is the points, lines, and polygons, if that's needed for what you're doing, um, as well as you can import your own raster data, your own imagery or remotely sensed um, information. So I wanted to show you a quick look at the types of imagery that's available. Um, you no longer have to go scrambling and figure out how to download uh, Sentinel imagery or um, Landsat or the NAPE imagery. Uh, it'll, it can all be usable for you up in Google Earth Engine. And then there are some derived data sets that are also available to you, focusing mostly on climate and weather and then also geophysical features. So as you can probably guess from the types of information that's available here, the use cases have involved things like habitat modeling, uh, risk of malaria, assessing the global surface water, certainly things like assessing uh, fires and ice caps melting and all kinds of things. So um, really great tool for this kind of uh, research that's at a continental to global scale, I would say. And here are some resources available for you um, to get a feel for how to use Google Earth Engine. And before we depart Google Earth Engine, I just wanted to mention one more related um, application. It's called Google Earth Engine Explorer. And anyone, you don't have to have an account for this, anyone can use Google Earth Engine Explorer to view and visualize many of the data sets that are available in Google Earth Engine. So for instance, in this screenshot, somebody has downloaded um, digital elevation data. Maybe it came as a default in the grayscale. So it was just all from white to black. And then you can uh, create a color ramp instead on how you want that to be symbolized. So um, yeah, you can, you can try your hand at that. And there's a, a tutorial that guides you through uh, some of the basic steps for uh, viewing and visualizing the kind of um, data and imagery that's available. Okay, we'll now take a look at other Google Earth products. Um, Google Earth is available from mobile. It's much like Google Earth for web um, on Android or, or iPhones or, or similar. Um, so yeah, if you would like to have that on your phone and you don't already have it on your phone, you can do that. Google Earth Studio is a little bit different and I did want to, hopefully I can show you the website there, but it's an animation tool 
that takes it to a, the next level of professional um, product, I guess, by using keyframe animation. And it's similar to uh, Google Earth Engine in that you not anybody can access it. You do have to fill out a form and then you wait for notification that you've been accepted to use it. To use it, you do need to have a Google account and you do need to use the Chrome browser. But notice that it's free for researchers or educators or nonprofit use. So that's kind of nice. Um, there's no nothing to pay to um, to get to use that. Um, and it can also you can upload pretty simple features or moderately sized uh, KMLs um, to include. And let me see if I can find my way back to. Um, I had it pulled up. Let's see if I'll just go from here. There we go. Okay, so I think the thing that works well to illustrate what this is like is not working. <laughs> okay, it just did black out. Um, but if this were working, what it would show you down here is um, like a, a way where you can change the speed at which your camera is moving around or the angle at which it's moving around from Google Earth and so forth. So um, I apologize for that. My, my um, computer is not cooperating today, but you can go to this uh, website and, and see the types of things that you can do to create a really polished uh, video that uses Google Earth imagery. All right, now this one is a little bit surprising for me. Um, when I started preparing for this workshop, I think late last month, the website for Google Earth AR and VR looked the same as it did two years ago, which featured uh, this person looking at Google Earth imagery in her uh, AR or VR headset. And she was doing things like walking around or, you know, flying over this terrain or being able to select a place on this globe and then zoom to it. Um, that link, which was this one here, no longer shows all of that. It, there's a different link that it leads to talking about many other things involving AR and VR. And it talks about Google Maps mostly. So what the website is now showing me is that it's kind of like for if you were a tourist, say, they have many uh, immersive views of global landmarks. So things like the Eiffel Tower or, or the Statue of Liberty or, you know, something like that and um, shows you like all the entrance points and things like that. And then it also enables you to get AR walking directions. So as you're progressing towards this landmark, it, it kind of has signage hovering over what you're seeing. Um, as you walk along and stuff. So it tells you where to turn and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I guess this is evolving. <laughs> and uh, I think these uh, Google Earth for VR is still available. I don't think they've stopped selling it, but they're just not featuring it as prominently on their website as they used to um, a month ago. So, and let's see. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about Google My Maps because there is just a bit of a tie-in uh, between Google Earth and Google My Maps. Um, it allows you to create simple customized maps to share, and you would access Google My Maps from within your Google account. However, if you have a UCR Google account, you're not going to be able to um, access My Maps. If you go here to more, Google My Maps is not going to be one of the things that you see. However, I have like just a private Google account and I do have access to Google My Maps. So um, there, that might be the same experience that you have. On mobile devices, to get to Google My Maps, what you would do is open your web browser and go to mymaps.google.com. There used to be an app, but I guess they have phased that out in favor of uh, people accessing it through a web browser. So here you see the interface. It's really, uh, pretty simple. 
um, or doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, so to speak. This tutorial is um, the one I used a while ago, and it's uh, for shark attacks off of the coast of Africa in a particular location kind of thing, so that you can play around with the data they have for that. Um, you can enhance the functionality of Google My Maps a little bit by using JavaScript. So um, it's still, it's not as a robust GIS as Google Earth Pro or, uh, you know, ArcGIS products or um, QGIS or anything like that, but you can make simple maps. And if that's all you need, that's great. Um, so now we're coming to the end of the workshop. I just wanted to provide a few more warnings. Some of them you've already heard from me and, um, and a slide with resources. Uh, we do request that uh, folks who attend our workshops fill out a survey to let us know uh, what they liked or what they would like to see instead of this or in addition to this. So, um, yeah, if you can just take a minute to to follow the link for the survey when it's in the chat, um, that would be really helpful. And uh, we'll we'll be sure to take a look at the answers there. It's all anonymous, of course. So. Um, so caveats or things to watch out for. When you search for information about Google Earth products, a lot of times outdated guidance will come up in your results. So you want to take a look at the dates that come up if possible. Although I have to say, in general, Google doesn't seem to update or change their, their Google Earth features very much. Certainly not at the pace of other GIS that I'm uh, used to dealing with. So the outdated guidance might be okay, but you just want to kind of take it with a grain of salt if you do see a date from 2015 or something like that in what comes up. As I mentioned, the placemark layer information that comes pre-populated in Google Earth Pro may be outdated, so you want to be on the lookout for that. I wouldn't take it as absolutely accurate. It could be, but maybe not. And as I, again, as I mentioned with Google Earth Pro, there is some variations on what is the most recent date of the most recent imagery and variations on the dates all in between, the earliest and the latest as well. And as far as image quality goes too, sometimes they just couldn't get good quality images. Um, so it's just because you see like super crisp, clear images for a particular location for one time frame. That doesn't mean that's the same quality of data you're going to get somewhere else on the planet. And um, if you have a black screen when you're using Google Earth for Web, which has happened to me, I've also had totally white screens <laughs> after a while. Um, well, restarting it can often work, at least for a while. But I've also included links to a couple other fixes that have been suggested if that happens to you. So here's the resources slide, um, kind of summarizing um, a lot of the information that's out there. And again, those two tutorials that um, Dr. Altman from Lehigh put together, I think are really instructive, uh, getting a little bit more into the weeds if you want to use Google Earth for a um, variety of, of purposes. Uh, she's got some good workarounds for you uh, in addition to step-by-step -step on how to do certain things. So with that, I will just pause and see if there's anything um, that you would like to ask. And again, um, this workshop will be available uh, the recording will be available in a couple of weeks, probably less. I, I prob we probably can get to editing the captions uh, a little bit faster than that. Um, but you never know what happens, so uh, just be on the lookout for that. And again, if you've registered for this workshop, I will be sending you um, the slides, and that will have all the links that are active available to you. So if if there are no questions, I was wondering if anybody in attendance has ever used any of these products and 
wanted to share um, any of their experiences with them? Or do you have some use cases that you're thinking of um, using any of these products? Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm Emmanuel. I actually used the Google Ads maps when I was uh, ATA last quarter. So it was quite interactive and it's interesting. And I cited too, you know, and learning visually. So that's actually why I decided to enroll for this workshop so I can create my, you know, for presentations in class or for future purposes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, did anybody else have any questions or want to, to share anything? Okay, well, um, if not, I guess we will um, say this workshop is done. So thank you so much for your attendance today. Thanks for your interest. And I, I hope you will have um, many happy adventures trying out these different Google Earth products. And again, please be in touch um, if you have any follow-up questions or need ideas on other things that you might want to do with mapping or GIS. So thanks again and have a good rest of your day. Bye.